Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Lucas, welcome back to Wilms Front. G'day Tim, how are you? Oh, I'm not too bad, uh, considering I'm still in lockdown Melbourne, you're in oh, uh, pretty much open uh, Queensland uh, there, uh, which, well, yeah, the rest of the country... Much up in the Sunshine State. Uh, rest of the country is uh, uh, open, and, uh, well, the, the Marxists in those states are, are clearly open for, uh, well, I wouldn't use the word business, because they, they, they hate business, but they're certainly back... Uh, <laughs> Uh, out on the street, uh, uh, causing as much uh, uh, chaos, intimidation, and destruction as possible. They certainly uh, they can couldn't wait to get back out on the streets, and now they're really getting into it. It's almost like they've been uh, got pent up with a bit of blue balls, and now they're just letting rip. Mm. Uh, uh, so, uh, coronavirus is an extreme risk still in Victoria. Uh, according to the uh, the Marxists and the Greens, but uh, everywhere else, uh, uh, we should be allowed to have the the biggest uh, protests uh, we like. That's apparently their logic. Even though uh, today, uh, New South Wales and Victoria recorded around the same COVID cases. Oh yeah, it doesn't have to make sense. But yeah, it is interesting looking at the uh, the little double standards that they have. It has appealed as actually. Uh, sort of uh, become clear to some of the people on the far left as well that they are sort of uh, in a little bit of muddy waters here. But, yeah, they still feel very free to condemn anyone in Melbourne who's an anti-lockdown sort of person, whilst at the same time being outraged that New South Wales police would try and shut down uh, protests around the University of Sydney. Well, uh, they love the Premier of uh, Victoria, Comrade Dan, who is... is as close to a communist as they're, they're going to get. So, of course, they're not going to complain too much about uh, his uh, leadership. But, uh, well, New South Wales uh, uh, has, well, what, what, what do they call her? What koala killer, uh, Gladys, that's, that's what they refer to her. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure. But, hey, look, you never know. Melbourne might end up getting a, a, a more sort of a radical... Premier at some stage. Never say never. Uh, yeah, yeah, who knows? It's foolish to predict the future as 2020 has, has shown us. And yeah, there's plenty of people waiting in the wings who'd love to take Dan's job and they're far more extreme than him. Uh, Queensland, your native state, is, is going to uh, an election, uh, which is, is probably why uh, the, the Marxists up there are, are willing to do so much uh, protests, even though they have a Labor Premier up there, uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk, or as she's been increasingly called now, referred to as uh, uh, Palachuk, or just the uh, the Chuk, because it's basically a, a contest between her and Dan uh, about who's the worst Premier. But uh, the LNP could win on October 31st. Deb Frecklington could become the, the Premier, though she's doing a pretty good job, and so is the, the LNP, of basically sabotaging their own campaign. Oh, yeah. They never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity up here. It's uh, just like how in the, in the last uh, state election, 2017, the LNP decided to put one nation down below uh, the Labour Party and it ended up costing them government. They could have been in a coalition or a minority government with one nation support, but instead they decided to virtue signal about how not racist they are. And, uh, yeah, so they ended up with... Uh, Another electoral cycle of the Chuk. I've never actually known what the proper pronunciation of her last name is. I apologise to any uh, sort of Eastern European or Slavic listeners who are out there. Oh, people are deliberately just calling her Palachuk now because it's how she uh, doesn't like her name pronounced. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure there's a correct way. Uh, but I just uh, don't care. <laughs> I shouldn't say it's uh, her comrades, more uh, Jackie Trad's uh, comrades, uh, the, the former uh, Deputy Premier and Treasurer who uh, stood aside uh, during a, a, a Crime and Corruption Commission uh, probe. Uh, she's the member for South Brisbane, which takes in West End, which is basically, you'd describe it as the, uh, the Fitzroy or Newtown 
uh, of Brisbane, and certainly uh, the the local Marxist activity there has fested out to a lot of Brisbane there, and they seem to have centred on uh, the University of Queensland for most of their uh, Marxist activism. How far is that away from West End? Uh, they're not immediately close to each other. I mean, UQ has its... Um, the, the extremists who are doing the organising on UQ are distinct from the ones who mostly do the stuff around West End. Two different groups. The one around West End um, generally is uh, they called the Unite Group, sort of a coalition of the former Brisbane branch of the Socialist Alliance, and uh, like sort of local anarchist groups as well, and they're fairly well connected with guys like Jonathan Th Jonathan Three, the uh, houseboat living local Greens councillor for Wollongabba, and uh, that's sort of his patch around there. They have a, a community centre there, which they use to hold uh, musical events and fundraisers and that sort of stuff. It used to be the um, the Resistance Centre, the branch office of the Socialist Alliance, but there was a split from the Socialist Alliance uh, a few years ago when. Um, because the, the Brisbane branch was much younger and had uh, a lot more uh, sort of new blood in it. The Socialist Alliance elsewhere in Australia tends to be sort of deteriorating and uh, dying off because they've uh, get, got, had most of their recruiting grounds taken by Socialist Alternative. Now, that's mainly who's doing the, like the attack on Prime Minister Morrison the other day at uh, University of Queensland was the, the Marxists involved there were Socialist Alternative. And um, they're in the middle of uh, their student elections period, I think they are there. So they, it was quite easy for them to grab some activists and go over and try and disrupt, well, successfully disrupt the Prime Minister's day. Uh, I, I know the, the fact that there's uh, student union elections at, at UQ basically because uh, Drew Pavlov, the, the uh, anti-CCP uh, <laughs> activist who is actually, he's a, he's most aligned his politics with the, the Greens, but uh, he's an old school leftist who cares about human rights that, well, it's how they used to be uh, 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 20 years ago. So he's, he's quite the, you, you would say, a, a independently minded, uh, which, which makes him quite unique uh, from the, the rest of the uh, modern uh, progressive left. Uh, but uh, yes, it, let's focus first on the, oh, the the Prime Minister Scott Morrison's visit. He's in Queensland to campaign for uh, Deb Frecklington, the, the LNP opposition leader, but he was at UQ uh, to basically check out their uh, coronavirus uh, vaccine trial. And his, he, he, his car got uh, tomatoes thrown at it was it was it was it the tomatoes that caused uh, red, the red, red paint yeah but there no, were tomatoes red, as red well paint, um yeah and the next day they tracked him down as well and threw brussels sprouts with uh, red paint on them at the car um i don't know if there was actually tomatoes but there was a lot of red paint involved i saw some tomatoes on the, the news i know that tomatoes uh, couldn't have been capable of causing that amount of red uh, on on his uh, police the the police car that he was uh, shuffled out on uh, they they hit one of the I think it was actually federal police and security with uh, the uh, the red uh, but for me who's uh, uh, been living under the Victorian police state with uh, we've seen the uh, Victoria police uh, arresting. Uh, uh, women and grandmothers at, uh, at, at beaches, and yet you know, University of Queensland, these Marxists are uh, uh, throwing things at the Prime Minister, of all people, and he's running out to a police, police vehicle <laughs> yeah, to running escape. Out, yeah, running out the back door and getting chucked in the back of a divvy van to escape. Mm. I mean, this is, it is really, really worrying that the Prime Minister's security detail didn't realise first, because even like you say yourself, you knew that there's student elections going on at UQ, all right? And during student elections, all of the various different student groups, they're out, put on like, you know, various shirts with the electoral front names on them, and they're going around desperately trying to get some of the students who do not give a flying fuck about those elections um, to actually vote. And that's been the way for decades and decades and decades. And the fact that the Prime Minister's security detail and the intelligence services who are supposed to be advising that security detail 
didn't realise that bringing the Prime Minister onto a campus, even no matter how quietly you've done it, on the same day that you've already got a Marxist group um, with their activists on campus and organised, wouldn't potentially lead to some issues is gobsmacking. Right? You've got all these ASIO agents who are apparently out there searching down evil far-right extremists and uh, apparently looking after Sunni terrorism as well. And not a single one of them, not a single sort of uh, intelligence service for the state police or for the federal police or for the federal agencies like ASIO seems to have paid any attention to the fact that the Prime Minister might be put in a position where he has to run out the back door and get bundled into a divvy van. And it's supposed to be the Prime Minister of the country. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, uh, absolutely sort of laughable. And it's not a, it's hardly a new phenomenon that uh, when a conservative uh, politician visits a, a university campus, whether they're student elections or not, uh, there's going to be uh, leftist Marxist uh, uh, students who are going to, to protest. I mean, uh, off the top of my head, uh, Julie Bishop basically had to get through, this was in 2014, a mosh pit of leftist students to get out. I think it was the the University of Sydney, which we'll get to uh, in that a moment. That was the University of Sydney? Yeah, no, that was a hilarious one because the guy who got, um, I think, eventually charged, but the charge was dropped with assaulting Julie Bishop, was Tom Rao, who... Um, became the Greens candidate. Oh, the, the bestiality who, guy. Yeah, the bestiality and necrophilia guy was the guy who tried to throw uh, Jolly Bishop down a set of stairs at the University of Sydney, which is an you know, interesting tidbit. But the ones at University of Queensland, uh, it's like, how would you... I think, believe they thought that because there was no prior announcement that this was going to happen, that it was kept quiet, that they wouldn't have to worry about protesters or anything like that sort of stuff. But... The fact that they didn't even know that there were student elections going on, so all the people who organised the protest would already actually be there, <laughs> right? organised, ready to go, is just, yeah, it's a laughable breach of security. And, yeah, the fact that these people are in charge of keeping the Prime Minister safe makes me wonder why we haven't lost, haven't lost more Prime Ministers than just Harold Holt. Has anyone been charged uh, over uh, the vandalism? Yeah, there was one 19-year-old girl charged. She doesn't appear to be one of the main members of the group. Okay, well, I guess that's a start. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, considering the, you know, covering police in paint, uh, assaulting security guards, vandalising a building, vandalising one of the extremely expensive, I think they're BMW ministerial cars, the bulletproof ones, and, um, yeah, forcing the Prime Minister on television to be bundled out the back of a... Uh, and the 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 Marxist rise in Brisbane has really, I, I think, fallen under the the radar because, well, uh, city of Brisbane's come a long day since the uh, conservative uh, iron fist rule of uh, Sir Joe Bjorki Peterson in the seventies and eighties. Uh, but uh, last year, uh, Brisbane uh, was the, the home of all those uh, Extinction Rebellion protesters who superglued themselves to roads and, and various other uh, uh, public works. Uh, they began to uh, go back out onto the street when the uh, uh, coronavirus restrictions uh, were lifted in, in Queensland, and they've been basically camping outside this uh, uh, asylum seeker detention facility at uh, Kangaroo Point, where there's been various scuffles with the, the Queensland police. Well, yeah, you, are, you mentioned Sir Joe Bielke. It's um, interesting you say that because the groups that are around today are directly descended from the groups that he was fighting with the Queensland police back in those days and trying to keep from disrupting, uh, holding disruptive protests and that sort of stuff. Um, like, uh, for instance, the, back then it was the International Socialists, or which became the International Socialist Organisation. And uh, the International Socialist Organisation eventually split off and dissolved, it's a long story, uh, that has its successor groups, uh, Socialist Alternative and uh, Solidarity. And uh, Socialist Alternative was, of course, the one that attacked Prime Minister Morrison. And Solidarity is the one that's been instrumental in organising those kangaroo point protests. Uh, so that they are all tied together. These are all sort of uh, groups which have a succession, groups that have a, an activist base going back decades. 
uh, it um, really shouldn't come as much of a surprise. They have grown rapidly in recent years, but uh, from a very small base. The Extinction Rebellion and the Uni Students for Climate Justice protests that really sort of sprung up uh, last year in Brisbane were organised by socialist alternative activists like uh, Catherine Robertson and um, Carl Jackson, who I believe were not from UQ, they were QUT students or QUT. I know that Catherine originally came from Melbourne and uh, that's another sort of tendency. Marxist activists, they do tend to move their um, their younger activists around the countryside to try and uh, sort of seed new organisations at new universities. But yeah, there's all connected groups and they're all, like, nearly every campaign is run by the same groups, just simply with different faces and different front groups on the front. Yes, it's come to uh, our attention that uh, Tom Tanuki, uh, the, uh, real name Thomas Stevens, who's the, the leader of uh, Yelling at Racist Dogs, he's uh, left Melbourne to, to go up to uh, Brisbane because he started filming the uh, well, the the public protests that he doesn't like up there, the the, the freedom uh, picnics and uh, uh, anti-lockdown rallies. Yeah, he's uh, been associated with various Marxist groups as well. He's more associated with anarchists. Um, he was hanging around a, a cafe in Melbourne, which is known for sort of its anarchist connections. He's connected through some of his friends with the old WikiLeaks party, which um, has sort of connections to autonomous and anarchist related sort of zones. Um, he made a speech at several socialist alternative meetings, including one before um, the protest that socialist alternative organised against Jordan Peterson in Melbourne. And um, so, yeah, he's got various connections to extremist groups. But again, it's like you say, he's the leader of yelling at racist dogs. He's pretty much the leader and as of now, probably the only member left. I was always amazed at how many fat people they managed to get. To <laughs> yeah, yeah, shows. there's plenty of photos. It's like, good God, man, they're, like, they're paying by the extra inch. So it's like walking billboards with, uh, you know, bellies that show up 10 minutes before the guy turns the corner. <laughs> and uh, of course, Tom himself has a bit of, bit of a big pot belly sticking out as well. It's... Uh, yeah, they're not the not the healthiest looking people. Uh, that particular crew, it's uh, quite interesting. But yeah, they're not serious people. They're not a serious group, and um, Tom Tanuki's not a serious person. I mentioned before uh, Drew Pavlov. Uh, he his uh, uh, commentary on the the UQ uh, student elections. I just want to get your opinion on him because. He, he, he's a leftist, but he's sort of a, an old school leftist, but he has uh, been supportive of the, the Kangaroo Point uh, uh, refugee uh, protest, though he has teamed up uh, with uh, Pauline Hanson and, and Bob Catter at, uh, at various times. He's certainly what you'd describe as a, a young political uh, madman. He's extremely effective at getting his face out there uh, in the, the, the media. And, and certainly uh, doesn't hold back from a, a public beef. He's taken on friendly Geordies this week over what he uh, said about uh, uh, the Uyghur uh, Muslims uh, being in camps because they're, they're, they're causing uh, trouble. And to my, uh, my uh, point of view, that a, a, a online beef between Drew Pavlov and friendly Geordies, that's a, a pretty, I would say, equal match. Um. It's good to put him in the same category as Friendly Geordies because he is in the same category as Friendly Geordies. They're both shameless self-promoters. <laughs> and uh, Just like Friendly Geordies, he's probably going to eventually end up doing ads for the ACTU and for Get Up and uh, taking money in that regard, from green, taking money for Greenpeace as well. And Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, uh, Drew is a, uh, a funny guy. Not as funny as Friendly George is, and not as good a sh not as good a self promoter yet, but he's uh, on that track. Drew's um, issues at UQ with the Marxists there is actually really quite interesting in regards to the uh, the China protests that he was involved in. Um, so there was uh, clashes between students on both sides um, of the Hong Kong protests sort of issue. And uh, Drew was very involved in organising protests um, about that. And Socialist Alternative, including Priya D, who organised the um, protest against 
Scott Morrison was there with a, a loud speaker, well, not a loud speaker, a megaphone. Um, she was, she tried to take over on behalf of the Socialist Alternative, tried to take over the, uh, the protests um, in favour of the Hong Kong protesters. When she found that she couldn't do that, she threw a tantrum and ran off and declared everyone, including Drew, was a, a white supremacist, including Andrew Bartlett of the Greens, uh, thinking that at the time the Queensland co-convener of the Greens was also a white supremacist. The Tibetans and the um, Chinese international students who were protesting were also white supremacists. Everyone was a white supremacist. And uh, it was one of the more amusing things that happened last year in regards to the Marxist EQ. But yeah, as you can tell, this is a a pattern that goes back quite a while. There is a pattern of radicalism on UQ. One of the um, socialist alternative sort of, uh, mem well, he's a former member of the faculty there, Tom Bramble. He was uh, a lecturer in industrial relations for many, many years. He's been a, a member of socialist alternative going back uh, to the 1990s. And uh, so, yeah, they've had uh, an in at UQ for quite some time. Let's now go down to the, the University of Sydney. Now, even though the state of New South Wales is uh, open for business, they have a strict limit on outdoor gatherings of 20. And since the, the Black Lives Matter uh, protests in early June, which they tried to stop uh, in the Supreme Court of, of New South Wales, they did a better job of uh, trying to prevent it than uh, a, a Victorian government uh, did and, and Dan Andrews, uh, but since then they've been uh, very well, and also the New South Wales Police have been very strict in enforcing this uh, twenty-person outdoor gathering limit. And uh, well, we saw uh, basically the the Black Lives Matter uh, Sydney movement uh, fizzle when uh, Paddy Gibson, uh, his uh, unlawful uh, BLM uh, rally, which uh, that was ruled by the uh, Supreme Court, was a flop and uh, Paddy Gibson got taken away in a uh, paddy wagon and, and three people got uh, fined $1,000. Yeah, that was quite funny. But then as soon as he was released, he was invited to New South Wales Parliament by Jenny Leong and David Shoebridge, who uh, had him sit down as anyone just in case anybody doesn't know, um, Paddy Gibson is a member of Solidarity, one of those revolutionary Trotskyist groups we were talking about just before. And he's an organiser for them. So you've got two, two elected members of the Greens inviting someone into the New South Wales Parliament who has as one of his openly avowed goals the overthrow of New South Wales Parliament and the Australian Parliament. So quite interesting. But yeah, University of Sydney, there's seen a lot of organising there. You've got um, various sort of uh, groups from University of New South Wales and um, also from Macquarie and their um, socialist alternative branches normally, but also other activists are coming from those other universities to the University of Sydney in order to more make up the numbers for these confrontations that they're orchestrating with police. And um, that's because the police there have gone through the Supreme Court again and have continued to get these um, marches made uh, illegal. So I think they're up to about $43,000 in fines last check. They just keep grabbing people and fining them. Some people like Adam Adelpore of Solidarity have been uh, arrested so many times now that they're going to be up in court with the potential for six months jail. Um, again, the, the, the sort of the, the stated reason for these protests is uh, against the higher education reforms that the Morrison government is putting through which would give less money to humanities and more money to STEM courses, which would affect the activist base of the far left groups because yes. that's where most yeah, that's where most of their activists yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. Those uh, reforms uh, got through the, the Senate recently with the help of uh, Centre Alliance. Uh, I'll just bring up the, uh, the new episode. It, it's got four bands now with the, the cheapest uh, being uh, teaching clinical psychology, English, maths, nursing, language, agriculture, 3,700, uh, allied health, other health, architecture, IT, creative arts, engineering, environmental studies, science, 7,700 per year, medicine, dental, veterinary science, 11,300 per year. And now the most expensive law, economics, management, commerce, society, culture, humanities, communications, and behavioural science, basically all the degrees that uh, 
overrated and uh, don't uh, guarantee employment after people have graduated? Well, yeah, I think it's something like 50% 50, 50 of um, law graduates in Victoria uh, never do their articles. So that's people who haven't just started a law degree but have finished a law degree. They never actually go on to even qualify for yeah, working in law. Yeah, law and commerce and are the new arts, basically. Yeah, along those lines. Uh, a lot of them find work in the NGO sector. Um, if with a law degree, you can, you know, still has a bit of prestige to it. But universities love law degrees because they um, they don't require any sort of uh, equipment. They pretty much just require a classroom. You can actually make money off selling the materials, the books and that sort of stuff. And there are a lot of books. So, uh, yeah, it's um, <laughs> uh, a course that universities love to pump out way too many people of. Same with communications degrees. It's like, most people go into a communications degree because they think that somehow they'll get into journalism. Nah, the only way you get into journalism is to get a degree of some sort and then know people. Uh, it's uh, Journalism is possibly one of the most nepotistic um, fields in Australia. It's just absolutely incredible that anyone thinks they can walk into a job um, yeah, without knowing somebody, without being connected. And, uh, and that's the only well, thing that makes you a so-called accredited uh, journalists, because here in Melbourne, there's been massive screeching by the I stand with Dan Crew. How dare Peter Credlin be allowed into uh, the, Dan's daily press briefing? She's not an accredited uh, journalist because, well, she hasn't done a, a either a degree or a a cadetship. And of course, the the uh, the concept of that uh, accredited or qualified journalist is a a dangerous thing in a democracy because who gets to decide who's an accredited journalist the uh the government but peter credlin has shown with her uh legal training and experience uh in a political office she knows much more she's been able to investigate much more about uh, the uh how the hotel quarantine uh private security contracts were uh set up than any of the so-called uh accredited journalists who'd studied at university or done a cadetship well, yeah, and I think it's, it's not so much the government controlling the accreditation. That's not really the goal. Oh, I'm just talking why... in overall terms, but yes, it's yeah. the, the mainstream media themselves who decide who's accredited. Yeah, and well, it's not even that. It's the, the university systems where journalists are trained. They are the ones who have the most to lose from journalists coming from fields outside of their remit. They are the ones who get to form the viewpoints and the worldviews of future journalists, and they like that. And it does mean that since nearly all journalists now come from that system, we have um, journalists in Australia who have almost come from either, they've been taught by the same teachers or their teachers were taught by the same teachers. So it's a very sort of uh, insular profession now, which is why they tend to think the same way about everything, amongst other reasons. Uh, which is why that, that was that uh, mysterious uh, coordinated uh, campaign against uh, George Christensen for appearing on uh, this program <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, but, well, uh, I think that was just the old uh, BuzzFeed Australia pipeline. The, um, you know, yeah. Josh, Butler and, Josh Butler and Cam Wilson knowing each other from BuzzFeed Australia, now sadly deceased BuzzFeed Australia, which I'm yeah. sure we're all devastated about. And, uh, yeah, journalists love listening to other journalists quoting other journalists and, and until another journalist says that it's not real and, yes uh, I, I noticed that uh, cam wilson his proof that uh, i uh, spread conspiracy theories was himself and apparently i'd been criticized for wearing the pinochet did nothing wrong shirt uh, by a uh, slack bastard <laughs> yeah so this man is an extremist who says he's an extremist? Well, this guy who thinks that all government is illegitimate and should be violently overthrown. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and he, he quoted himself as a source. Oh, Can't really? Listen. That's a new one. Yeah, oh. he, he quoted, yeah. <laughs> This guy okay. uh, spreads conspiracy theories uh, because look at uh, my, uh, uh, my uh, tweets proving it. Yeah, if he wasn't in the club... Right, the journalism club that he managed to get in, you know, by working at the ABC originally. If he wasn't in that club, he'd just be a, a laughable idiot sitting on the side of the road that 
ranting to himself that no one would listen to. And that's that's it. That's why these people love their accreditation so much and they cling to it, the idea that I'm an accredited journalist or I'm part of the club. Mm. Even though... They didn't have, most if they of, didn't have that, they'd have nothing. Even though most of the, the recent rags they've been writing for are now shut down. Because <laughs> yes. I think Josh uh, Butler again, is on his fourth uh, job now because BuzzFeed Australia shut down, HuffPost Australia shut down, and also uh, 10 Daily recently shut down. Yeah, does he, does he think maybe if he cuts his hair, he might be able to, you know, go work for someone who doesn't collapse? I, I think it's more than just his, his hair. I mean, he is based in, in Melbourne, uh, to my knowledge, Josh Butler. He does have terrible, terrible hair. Uh, it is awful. Yeah, basically, but... uh, peak uh, Antifa, uh, lefty, soy, hipster look. No, nah, the sort of meth teeth hanging out of their head, bad tattoos and piercings, dead-eyed Antifa people that still have better fashion sense than Josh Butler. Mm. Which is why maybe but, he doesn't appear on TV much, neither does uh, Kim <laughs> Not even on the drum. Oh, good God, man. The drum is just, that is good comedy. Good quality comedy if you can sit through it. Uh, it's, it is still uh, easier to get through than Q&A. Yes, quite. But as um, people would have noticed from the news, it was just on Wednesday was the last of these protests in uh, University of Sydney that was or has been organised by um, not just Marxist groups, but also members of the Labor left um, on the student council there, and uh, by Grassroots Independence, which is a, a group mostly confined to University of Sydney that uh, has traditionally um, provided activists for the Greens, although not always. And um, altogether, they've organised uh, various of these protests. They've tried getting around the law in cute little ways. They had a protest where everyone, because the limit is 20 people, they had groups of 20 people spread out across a, a large, the, the large quadrangle that uh, you said, and the police said, nah, you're still part of a single protest and arrested. Um, they tried setting up a protest and then um, had everyone run, sprint towards uh, a road, which they then blocked um, to get around the police lines, which they successfully did. Uh, that was uh, late September, well, probably about two weeks ago, probably. And um, just on Wednesday, they had uh, their latest one, which was supported wholeheartedly by staff, naturally, particularly um, Dr. Nick Reimer, who's uh, also another member of Solidarity, like Patty Gibson, like Adam Adelpo, like the people who organised the Kangaroo Point protests in Brisbane. These all, again, part of the same groups. They're all linked together. Uh, he's a linguistics professor at UCID, and he was part of uh, helping to organise to get all the students to come out and join in these protests, which might see them get arrested or $1,000 on the spot fines. So, yeah, real duty of care there, Nick. Well done. As a Melbourneian, uh, I'm quite uh, conf conflicted uh, about uh, the, uh, the New South Wales police uh, arresting these uh, uh, Mar uh, Marxists for, for protesting and breaching uh, public health orders because, uh, well, uh, obviously it's uh, illegal to have any form of protest here in Melbourne. You've seen the, the Freedom Day uh, events uh, being uh, shut down brutally uh, by Victoria Police and also uh, New South Wales Police uh, showing that they are apolitical. They also brutally shut down the the Freedom Day uh, protest in in Sydney's uh, Sydney's Hyde Park, uh, <clears throat> which was uh, showing uh, solidarity, a uh, not in the communist term, uh, with uh, uh, Victorians. Uh, I, I, it is good to see that uh, the the police are cracking down on these uh, Marxist rebel rousers, uh, but of course I don't believe that there should be uh, restrictions on on peaceful protests. So that's that's where I'm uh, conflicted there. But of course, it is you know lovely to see uh, the, the 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 Marxists screeching when they're getting arrested. Oh, it is nice. And the um, the one on Wednesday caused a bit of controversy because there was a a law and social justice professor talking about those legal those law degrees again. 
Um, and he was forced to the ground by police because he was a part of the protest. And he came out later, he's written a, um, an article for Sydney Morning Herald about how terrible it was that he was temporarily placed under arrest and how it was a gigantic miscarriage of justice. And you had all these um, other academics go, screaming on Twitter about this, just completely raising hell. How dare you touch one of us? We are the holy people, the high priests. How dare you put your profane hands on our sacred persons, on the sacred person of one of our, uh, you know, one of the elect. And uh, it was just... Uh, you can do whatever you like to those protesters in Melbourne. You can beat the crap out of them. You can run them over with your car if you feel like it. But, oh, God, God, don't touch a professor. Don't touch one of the, you know, the cardinals of the cathedral. And the, the, the two uh, New South Wales Green Marxists that you mentioned before, David Shoebridge and Jenny Leong, they have actually attended those uh, University of Sydney uh, events. David, yeah, David Shoebridge was on the one on Wednesday. Uh, but, he was a uh, speaker. Uh, uh, but uh, contrast that uh, with the uh, Victorian Greens leader, uh, Samantha Ratnam, who has voted for Dan's uh, six-month uh, state of emergency extension. She voted in favour of the <laughs> omnibus bill and uh, uh, she hit out at uh, far-right uh, nationalists for undermining Victoria's uh, public health response uh, to the coronavirus. <laughs> well, it's not a public health response, it's a police state uh, response because well uh previously the fines for illegal gatherings were 1652 dollars which still were the highest in australia now they've been beefed up to 4957 but uh, uh it's the Victorian police state has just been the you know, insane fines. There's some guy who's been fined 24 times and they're not dragging him before the courts uh, to uh, to jail him, which is the what seems to be occurring uh, in Sydney. Oh, yeah, it's interesting that Nate did brain's hypocrisy on this. It, um, I mean, there's a, a front group set up by mostly by socialist alternative in New South Wales, and they all these groups have front organisation after front organisation. Just to, they all usually always avoid working under their own names, and it's called uh, Democracy is Essential New South Wales. And the signatories to that, the like initial signatories to launch that project, included um, Maureen Faruqi, the Green Senator, uh, David Shoebridge, Jenny Leong both uh, Greens Members of Parliament, uh, Jamie Parker, Greens Member of Parliament, Jonathan Sree from Brisbane again, uh, and all signing on to a uh, Marxist organised campaign saying that everyone should be able to protest. And then Samantha Ratnam in Melbourne is saying that uh, is voting for bills to say that no one should be allowed to protest, even though there are similar levels of infection and death in New South Wales and Victoria, like you said before. Uh, though I, I should give a shout out to Maureen Faruqi's son, Osman Faruqi, who is, is now living and working in Melbourne because he has been very critical of the Victorian police state and very critical of the Victorian government when it comes to contact tracing, their, uh, which is their poor contact tracing is partly uh, why we're still uh, in, in lockdown. So he is being, I would say, a consistent opponent of the uh, police state. Well, yes, but he was a consistent opponent right from the beginning because he believed and went into all sorts of data mining to try and prove to himself and to everyone, all of his uh, followers on Twitter, that the COVID lockdowns were originally targeting and disproportionately targeting Aboriginal people and that it was all a gigantic racist plot. So once you've got up uh, and sort of nailed your colours to the mast of coronavirus restrictions are all a racist plot by a white supremacist country, it's kind of hard to get down off that horse. So, it's, um... Well, if you look at the breakdown of the, the fines that are being issued, they are uh, disproportionately to non-white uh, communities in proportion to their, their actual population uh, size. And you've seen a lot of uh, the the lefty legal centres here, such as the Flemington and Kensington Legal Centre, uh, which run the Police Accountability Project and the Fitzroy Legal Centre. Uh, they've been very critical of the, the excesses of the fines and the, the police state. And of course, they're very left uh, legal centres. So, uh, well, they were well. originally... Yeah, both of those legal services were originally founded, I think, in the 70s and the 80s, depending on which ones, which, by anarchists. They were 
originally anarchist organisations, back when anarchists did something other than running to journalists with names of people who said naughty things on the internet. Mm. Uh, so that was, they were started as left-wing extremist organisations and it's, they still um, are connected to um, left-wing extremist organisations today. Anthony Kelly, um, who's with the Flemkent Legal Centre, he gave a talk on how to pretty much break the law to the anarchist book fair, where, um, I think it was a couple of years ago. And uh, there's another one whose name, I forget the primary, um, who's been the primary, a woman who's been the primary lawyer in getting Victoria Police to stop doing stop and searches on African youths. Um, she's been connected to Solidarity, Socialist Alternative and Socialist Alliance. So yeah, they've all got connections to left-wing extremists. So at least in that regard, they're being consistent, I guess. Hmm. I, I'm at the this, at this stage now given uh, not many people outside of Victoria uh, understand how horrible it is. It's as bad, the lockdown is as bad as you've heard, heard it is. So. Anyone who uh, is uh, uh, opposing it and uh, critiquing the Andrews government, whether they come from the far left or the far right, uh, you know, I'm I'm thankful for that. And uh, I've even appreciated uh, members of the the hippie movement uh, this year uh, opposing uh, the. Uh, coronavirus uh, lockdowns, arguing for for free choice. So when it comes to things like uh, uh, vaccinations and, and and medications, this is the surreal a uh, twenty twenty uh, world. Yeah, oh, I'm not as forgiving as you, Tim. <laughs> well, I, I am the Victorian here. You're a Queenslander. Yes, but uh, yeah, still no. They, uh, these people want you dead. They want your kids dead. They want uh, everyone in your family dead. They're willing to wait until you die, but they just want to make sure that people like you don't exist anymore. Well, let's move on to a, because the, the main uh, hard questions at Dan's daily press briefings have come from News Corp uh, journalists. Obviously, Peter Credlin has a show on Sky News, uh, Rachel uh, Baxendale works for The Australian, Alex White, Herald Sun, Sophie Ellsworth, News Corp, Gabriella Power, uh, uh, Sky News, and the, the I Stand With Dan cultists, you're not allowed to criticise him at all, and if they, they just got rid of the uh, News Corp Murdoch journos, Dan would just be getting, basically, you could call them Dorothy Dix's questions oh, yeah. uh, every, every day, and uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, former Prime Minister, who seems to blame his failure as a Prime Minister on the uh, on the Murdoch media. He has Murdoch, Murdoch derangement syndrome. He's called for a royal commission into the abuse of monopoly power of the, the Murdoch media and has bragged that he's got over 200,000 signatures uh, so far. And I get the feeling that when Dan's no longer Premier, he's like, I would have... Uh, uh, done, uh, survived better politically through the pandemic if it wasn't for, you know, bloody Murdoch, Murdoch. <laughs> yeah, it's, the Murdoch derangement syndrome is real and it, it serves a real psychological purpose for most people on the left and it isn't an extreme left thing, it it goes across most of the left. It, um, it's an excuse because their ideas in their mind are so self-evidently true that the only way anyone could possibly disagree with them is if they're being brainwashed by nefarious actors. That people are too stupid to see what the truth is because all they do is read misinformation and disinformation and fake news. And that's the only way that um, anyone could possibly disagree with me. It isn't that they could look at the same sort of ideas and come to a different conclusion. That's not possible. Uh, the conclusion is so self-evidently obvious and morally good. So there must be uh, some sort of conspiracy around it. I love Kevin Rudd jumping on this though. It is amazing. The guy who, like, yeah, in 2007 was endorsed by every single Murdoch newspaper in Australia, except for the Hobart Mercury and the Australian. And he's, <laughs> it's like, yeah, the, if there is a vast Rupert Murdoch conspiracy, Kevin, that, that conspiracy endorsed you. It's, uh, you're not living in the real world. He was happy uh, to take the endorsement at the time, but when 
it's it's turned it turned against him then it's like ah they're uh, abusing their i mean this whole thing that they have a a monopoly i mean it's less true now than ever i mean the murdoch media empire is significantly smaller since uh 20th 21st century fox was was sold and given that there's so much more online rags now uh, that uh, people read and the fact that to ne read nearly any murdoch uh, publication or watch any murdoch media you have to pay for it well yeah and the stuff that you don't isn't always right of center oh, mean, news.com.au yeah news.com.au is the most read news site in australia and it is free to air oh, free to one free to read mm. and it is decidedly left of center and so the biggest Murdoch vehicle in Australia, per eyeball, is left wing. Uh, these people are not living in the real world. Right? But they need to have a psychological crutch. They need to have someone to blame. Right? There must be a conspiracy, because if there isn't a conspiracy, then that means they actually have to engage with the arguments of people who disagree with them. And they don't want to do that. Hey, who wants to do that? It's hard. Right. It's a lot easier to just say these people must be stupid brainwashed sheep. I'm the smart one. It's a very sort of flattering ideal to have. Right. And you see it not just um, sort of on the broad Australian left, you see it on the right as well. It's like um, when people say, oh, it, um, the people protesting in the street, uh, they must not have jobs. And, um, because I don't go out and protest in the street. I don't actually organise around causes that I care about. But they must not be as busy as me. It's like, well, the truth is most of them do have jobs. Right? There's a significant minority who are very strong activists that help get those large crowds out there who are sort of student activists um, and that sort of stuff. But mostly these people do have jobs. And um, you're just lying to yourself. The same with the whole George Soros did it. Uh, George Soros must be paying all the Antifa. No, these people just genuinely really, really disagree with you. And um, they have a different worldview than you do. Probably can't live in the same country together considering how divergent those worldviews are. Uh, and that's the same sort of thing which presses so many people towards the Murdoch derangement syndrome thing. And it's just really quite strange when you see the left-wing journalists who work for Murdoch on Twitter <laughs> just trying to justify their employment to their friends on Twitter who are working or usually these days not working for uh, other other outlets. It's uh, yeah, it's incredible because for a lot of them, to a lot of um, journalists who work for Murdoch Media, they are left wing. Most of them are. Um, the study that was done by University of the Sunshine Coast showed that the majority of journalists who work for News Corp are left wing. Um, there's a larger minority that votes right wing than in the rest of the media. Mm but uh, they are majority left-wing in their leanings. So every day they have to come to work and chuck on their Twitter on their phone and see all of their mates saying that they work for the evil, evil monolith which is causing everything in the world to go wrong. And no one wants to disagree with your friends, especially not left-wing, if they're not used to being challenged. Right? They grew up, went to primary school, went to high school, went to university, and then went straight into the workforce. And they've usually never really been in a situation where their ideas were in the minority and they ever felt challenged by it. Uh, they've lived in this bubble their entire lives, and now they're on Twitter, the uh, ultimate of all bubbles. So, yeah, it's um, a really interesting sociological thing, and it is fucking terrifying that they genuinely don't care anymore about whether or not people who disagree with them should have any right to any platform whatsoever. It's clear that argument has been had. It's over. And they believe that... While in the past, about 60, 70 years ago, left-wingers were arguing for free speech, that was just because they felt like they weren't entirely the establishment yet. Now they are the establishment. All the arguments have been settled. It's not just the science of climate change has been settled. All the arguments have been settled. And you can have any opinion you want, as long as it's from the extreme left to the center left. And everything outside of that, we tolerate you. Maybe, if we feel like it. And if you start winning, we smash up your events. We rip off your Trump hats. We beat the crap out of you and we shoot you in the street. And those lefty uh, journos at, uh, at News Corp, uh, they're, they're more than happy to, to, to take Murdoch's uh, money, but uh, when they're working for another media outlet, then uh, they're more than happy to 
uh, uh, bite the hand that previously fed them. Uh, case in point, uh, Rick Morton, who uh, wrote for The Australian for many years. In fact, uh, he was the, the main propagator of fake news about uh, Gavin McGuinness that got him denied a visa to, to tour Australia. Now he's working for the Saturday paper, uh, funded by uh, Maurice Schwartz, uh, who also funds Black Ink, Black Ink Books and Quarterly Essay. He, uh, I think it was earlier this year, uh, wrote a, a massive uh, dump on his former employer, News Corp. Oh, yeah, he actually came out and um, attacked News Corp whilst he was still working for them, um, saying that, oh, um, like, we're all good left wingers inside the Australian. There's like a resistance amongst left wing journalists inside the Australian, but when the the um, the election starts coming around, and then you know the editors come around. They put pressure on people to not have left wing opinions. Like, yeah, it's because you're supposed to be the only classical liberal newspaper in Australia. <laughs> the fact that the majority of you are left wing that work there is kind of a red flag, to be honest. Right, uh, but uh, he didn't see that as a problem. He saw the problem being trying to stop journalists from reporting on things the way that journalists want to. Yeah. And most journalists come from the humanities system, like we were talking about before. The same humanities system that pro produces those activists that attacked Scott Morrison in uh, Queensland this week. And even though they control the, the left, all of the mainstream media, the fact that there's one which is not completely left, uh, they, uh, they can't stand that. Well, yeah, because that's why they see it is once that's gone, then everyone will agree with them. Yeah. And it won't, won't be the case, of course. They'll just find, but then they'll have to find a different thing, uh, a different uh, scapegoat to attack. Well, that's where, uh, when they'll uh, start to focus on uh, more on uh, people such as myself, uh, Wilms Front, the uh, Unshackled. Uh, in that Josh Butler article, Christina Keneally, Shadow Home Affairs Minister, called me an extremist and that uh, called this. Uh, uh, show alt-right, even though I don't know what that term even uh, means uh, anymore. Well, this is the thing. Christina Keneally is at the same time calling for right-wing extremist groups to be placed on the terrorist list, and she just called you a right-wing extremist. So it was good to uh, see uh, Liberal Senators uh, Erica Betts and Conchetta Ferravanti Wells, both former uh, uh, ministers, basically call out uh, ASIO for having this uh, right wing uh, extremist classification and saying to ASIO, you really need to uh, redo this because you're basically saying that, uh, uh, implying that those who have socially conservative views uh, are. Uh, right-wing uh, extremists. Well, yeah, left-wing extremists who openly say they want to overthrow the government, ambush the Prime Minister this week and forced him to be husked away by security in the back of a police car whilst they vandalised his ministerial vehicle. But ASIO is concentrating on right-wing extremists because Renton Tarrant went down to Christchurch and was a retarded mass murderer. Uh, one guy, that's it, connected to no other group, uh, connected to a member of no organisation. Um, whereas there are left-wing extremist organisations with membership who are lecturers teaching the next generation of teachers, teaching the next generation of lawyers, teaching the next generation of all sorts of members of the upper middle class and imparting their viewpoints onto them every single day whilst being paid by the taxpayer. And this is not really a concern at all. And even when these groups start attacking the Prime Minister, even when these groups are openly flouting the laws that are being put in place in New South Wales, uh, they, like, I remember the ASIO guys coming out saying, oh, we're um, very worried about right-wing extremism with uh, increased our uh, stuff to 30% or 40% for, for right-wing extremism. Um, it's just like, it's just like fucking 50 guys nationwide who uh, spend too much time on the internet. Yeah, that's basically uh, and what it is occasionally go out at night and put up edgy stickers and congratulate each other about how fucking retarded they are. Uh, that's essentially what we're talking about here. This is what an Australian senator in Christina Keneally is getting all hot under the collar about. Uh, meanwhile, you've got groups like, well, the Socialist Alternative has over 500 activists and they are very dedicated and motivated activists and they're on every single university campus in Australia. And that's just the biggest group. And there's a whole plethora of other groups as well. Yeah. Uh, Christina, uh, can you
to the right of Malcolm Turnbull as a far-right extremist. I mean, uh, uh, those who attend and speak at uh, CPAC Australia are considered uh, extremists in, in her mind. Ooh, she tried to get clever. CPAC uh, 2019 shut down and she must be extremely pleased that uh, Lauren Southern has been cancelled from uh, speaking at uh, CPAC Australia 2020. Well, yes, of course. And that would be partially because of the pressure being put on the culture by people like Christina Keneally. They understand how this war is fought. They understand how to fight a culture war. People on the right don't, which is why the right continues to lose. And I'm going to have to wrap up there, Tim. Yep. I will reach the end uh, of my questions here. It's been great to catch up with you, uh, Lucas, and, and gain your insight, uh, expertise, and uh, information. And you do a good job with uh, exposing all of this, even though most of it is publicly available information. It's just not reported on. Thank you very much, Tim. Thanks for having a chat. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.